Well, good morning, Potomac Valley Church. It's amazing and so encouraging to be with you guys this morning. Uh, my name is JJ Griffin. This is my lovely wife and beautiful bride, Trinity Griffin. And uh, we, <clears throat> I'm Rizzi. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm originally from Texas, and she's originally from California, but we met in Colorado Springs and became Christians there, and now we are currently leading the church in Colorado Springs. Uh, we've been in the ministry for almost 10 years, and mainly campus ministry. Uh, I was baptized in 2010. She was baptized in 2011. Uh, we got married in 2013, and God has blessed us with three amazing, beautiful children. Uh, we have our daughter, Tommy, who's four. Our Thomason, we call her Tommy. And then our son, Jameson, we call him Bubba because he's just a tank. And, uh, and if you hear a blood-curdling scream from the Kids' Kingdom room that can break the sound barrier, that's probably him. And uh, he just has a full of personality. And then we have our five-month-old baby, Hudson, as well. Um, and uh, and she's, uh, yeah, she's five months old. And like I said, we've had the joy of serving in the campus ministry in the church in Colorado Springs, and we have seen God transform so many lives in powerful ways, because that's what God is in the business of doing. He's transformed our life very powerfully, and it's so amazing that through the cross that we can have amazing friendships and relationships, and so we've seen so many best friends uh, come you know, through Jesus and through the church in Colorado Springs. And uh, it reminded me of a scripture in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. It says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. And I think sometimes we can get caught up so much on our own work that we can lose sight of the work that Jesus is doing in our lives and in our hearts. And at this time, I'm, I'm going to let my wife share a little bit about her story. Yeah, it's truly an honor to be here with you all. And it's been a joy that our church have really hosted us and loved us and taken care of us. We're so grateful for that. But the whole Potomac Valley is such a special church. And we have seen and heard all the way in Colorado, Colorado Springs, almost to the West Coast, uh, just about your community and your faith and your love. It has been such a blessing to come, and we hope to learn so much from you all and to be able to take back what God is doing here and spread that further among our fellowship. So you are God's handiwork, and we are grateful for the example that you are setting. Uh, we probably all feel encouraged by visiting sister churches, uh, for me, I think it just hits a little bit differently. Before becoming a disciple, I had a very limited experience of church. Um, I grew up with a single mom and two older half-brothers. So God was mentioned from time to time. My mom had grown up Catholic. But we had never seen Jesus be practiced or um, participated in my home in any way. And my actual first experience of church, the only other church I've been to outside of the ICOC, was when I was 12 years old. I had just committed a felony for Grand Theft Auto, and for some reason, my elderly neighbor thought it would be a good idea to take me to church. And so you would think it would be so I could get right with God. You know, what's a 12-year-old doing stealing the cars? Um, no. So actually, that's not where my head was at. I had a bunch of community service hours I had to serve, like as my punishment for that. And so get this, they, she took me there so I could serve in, bless their hearts, their children's ministry. <laughs> who does that? Who lets a felon? I'm like, huh, I don't know how you guys do your screenings here. <laughs> My son's back there now, so I hope it's a little tighter than that. But uh, yeah, so... I am grateful for that experience, though. That was my only exposure to church at a young age. But for me, it builds my faith because I'm able to look back and see that God had already been putting stepping stones down in my life. Way back then, he was leading me to himself. My whole life, God was working. And when I think of the cross, I think of Luke 9, 24 and 25. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. 
But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? This is a great paradox, and this was my life. Growing up, I wanted a different life so badly. I wanted to improve my life so badly. We were on welfare and food stamps. We had no car a lot of the time. My mom sold drugs out of our house. My, I wore my brother's hand-me-downs till fifth grade. I was just a ragamuffin and I was beaten up at home. I was made fun of at school. I was, there was a lack of supervision in my home and I was sexually abused more than you could count on one hand by the time I was 10. I was embarrassed, I was insecure, I was ashamed, and I was determined to have a different life, and I would do whatever it took to get there. God laid down another stepping stone for me when they started a wrestling program at our middle school. I was constantly getting suspended for fighting, so my teachers thought this would be a good outlet to channel my energy, and, and it was a good outlet. It helped, uh, and through that stone that God laid, he led me to wrestle through high school and all the way on to Colorado Springs to train at the Olympic Training Center, and I was a part of Team USA from 2007 to 2016, and yeah, let's go move fast. Team. So it was there in the fall of 2011 that I was reached out to by a teammate and I became a disciple. I love that God chose wrestling for me, to get to me, to use me. When I think of wrestling, I think to battle, to fight. And all my life I had been fighting. Fighting for my safety and security, fighting to be someone for others or to myself, fighting for control fighting to be loved. What I learned through the cross, and as Luke 9 depicts, it's okay to be fighters, and that's good, but we only need to fight for one thing, and that's surrender. God's way of doing things has flipped me upside down more than any wrestling moves did. And I've had to constantly learn to fight, learn, submit, and resubmit to surrendering to him. That was and is my toughest battle, surrendering my desires, my pride, control, surrendering my whole life and everything I love. None of this would be possible without Jesus. I'm so grateful for him and how he lived and how he modeled to us true surrender so I and we could have a chance at life. The cross is a reminder for me of a perfect, holy God who gave up everything for us so we could have everything that truly mattered. The only thing we have to fight is to surrender. Amen. She has such a powerful story, and I know you guys are all thinking one thing. Can she beat you up, JJ? And the answer is yes. But she can also beat you up, too. So I have her on my side. Um, I love hearing Trin's story and how Jesus and the cross has transformed her. And I am continue to be amazed by how God has worked his grace in her life and now our life. And how her fighter spirit is also coupled, coupled with an amazing grace and beauty and love. And for me... Uh, I shared the scripture in Ephesians 2 because for me, my worth has always been tied to how much I do. And I've always been, spent my whole life trying to prove myself by how hard I could work. Uh, I grew up as an only child and my dad was a football coach. Uh, he coached every level of high school and every level of college. And, um, and I've, I was always a daddy's boy. I always loved everything that he did. And I fell in love with football at a young age. But I was never the strongest. I was never the fastest or the most talented. I feel like I always had to work extra hard. Um, I played football at Odessa Permian. So if, uh, if you know the, the movie Friday Night Lights, that was my high school. And so, you know, in, in Odessa, Texas, football is God. You know, that's kind of what you do. And, and for me, that was great at the time because that's what I loved. That's what I loved. And uh, so I had to work so hard for everything that I ever got. 
Um, I worked hard. I finally was a starter my senior year. Uh, I went to junior college for a couple years to um, try to, uh, you know, get a little stronger and faster. And then I actually walked on to Texas Tech, made the team, and earned a scholarship by my senior year. Um, so it was amazing for me that experience. But part of the part of the negative side of that was who I am is how hard I work. Who I am is how hard I work. And though it is great to work hard in many ways, um, no matter how hard I worked, I could never outwork my sin. You know, never. No matter how hard I worked, I feel like I could never achieve enough love and fulfillment in my life. And so that work ethic on the football field also turned into. Uh, a work ethic for for people pleasing. You know, I wanted to be accepted and loved by so many people that I would do whatever it takes to fit in with them. You know, that also led to sexual addictions for myself, um, to just um, allowing all kinds of sin into my life uh, that I never thought would ever be there. And I was met uh, in 2010. I was getting my hair cut. Um, <clears throat> one of my best friends now reached out to me uh, in the lobby of a haircut place, of a barber shop. And uh, he, gave, he gave me his number on a sticky note. And I remember just after our conversation thinking, man, there's something different about this guy. I need to hold on to this. And together we were able to study the Bible and just seeing the words of Jesus and the life of Jesus transformed my life, transformed my life. And so my story for me is it is good to work hard for Jesus in the ministry now. And it's amazing but the moral of the story is it's all about the work that he is doing in our life. And when we remember the cross and the sacrifice that he made on the cross for us, that is really the end all be all. That we need to surrender our lives to Jesus because he is Lord and he's the one that can ultimately transform our lives. I spent my whole life trying to prove myself by my own worth or prove my own worth by how hard I work. And what Jesus shows us on the cross is that he proves to us our worth by his work. So let's go ahead and pray for the communion at this time. Father, you are amazing. And just as you transformed our lives in so many ways, God, I pray that you continue to transform the lives of everyone in this church building today, Father. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the sacrifice that he made on the cross for us. Thank you that you sent him down to this earth. Thank you for his words that stick with us on a regular basis, God. God, we need you and we need Jesus in our lives. As we take communion today, Father, we pray um, that your sacrifice would continue to transform us by your love and your grace. And we love you in Jesus' name, amen. So I'm absolutely blown away just by JJ and Trinity just sharing their story. Thank you guys so much for what you guys shared. It's amazing how God works in our lives and just does incredible things to help us to really draw close to him. Uh, at this time, what we're going to do is we're going to take some time to give contribution. But before we go into giving contribution, what we want to do over the next several weeks is take some time just to have a bit of a fireside chat. We talk about financial freedom. Right. And, um, you know, there's that incredible principle that many of us have embraced and maybe some of us are familiar with, but I'd, I want to share with you in light of a passage that we're going to look at from 
1 Timothy chapter 6. So as you're making your way to 1 Timothy 6, I just want to share with you the principle of 10, 10, 80. And that's the principle of the fact that with whatever God has given you, with whatever means God has given you, and God's blessed us in incredible ways here uh, in Prince William County, here in Northern Virginia, here in the Potomac Valley Church, that you give first to God. And then that you put money aside for your own future, that you take 10% and you give that to God. You take 10% and you put that in savings and put that aside. And then you spend the next 80% on all of your expenses, your responsibilities, um, other things that you have to do. If you would live this way, and if I live this way, many people that are very, very successful have told me, that by the time you're 65, 67 years old, you should be able to live a fairly decent life. Maybe not here in Northern Virginia, because it's super expensive, but maybe off in your, 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 your favored resort uh, or further down in, in Southern Virginia. You can live a pretty amazing life. I'm just kidding. You can actually live a really amazing life. The key is not so much about how much money we have, but how we manage it. And as a church, what we want to do is not simply talk to you about giving to the church, but really be a resource to you to help you in your own life to experience financial freedom. Paul was talking to Timothy, and in 1 Timothy chapter 6, he addresses contextually some issues, and he'd been addressing them all through 1 Timothy of false doctrine. And I'm going to read a bit of text here so we can get the context of what's happening. You guys still with us? says in, in verse 3, hang on, let me put my glasses on so I don't get in trouble with my wife. It says, if anyone teaches false doctrine that does not agree to sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, he is conceited and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant tension between men of corrupt minds who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. See, what was happening in the early church is people were seeing these large gatherings of people from all different backgrounds coming together and they thought, man, this is a great group of people that we can rally for ourselves and teach them false things and we can make some money out of this. Because sometimes people see a crowd and they see an opportunity. And Paul is explaining to Timothy that that's how people can be. But he says in verse 6, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we could take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we, are, um, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptations and a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. Many of us have heard this passage about the love of money being the root of all evil. And sometimes we have a negative view about money and we don't think about money the way God does. What's interesting about Jesus is he actually speaks more about money than any other subject because money can have such a huge impact in our hearts. You know, there's a wise person that once said that the furthest distance that any person will ever travel is the 18 inches between your head and your heart. Because so many times we can have in our head something that we should do, but our hearts are not where they need to be. And so Paul goes on to explain something else to Timothy that I think is important for us as we have this little fireside chat. Amen? Amen. In 2 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17, so you know the context. Hey, people are going to see a crowd and think they can make something out of it. I'm glad you also found it, Siri. <laughs> Siri's always finding things for me. And uh, somebody that's tech savvy is going to tell me how to turn off my watch. It's all right. But in verse 17, it says this. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment, 
Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of life that is truly life. Paul says it's important that you command those who are rich in this present age not to be arrogant or put their hope in wealth. You know, I went to Costco yesterday and um, chicken went up from a dollar to a dollar forty nine. That's, by the way, like a whole chicken. And I really like cooking whole chickens. There's uh, inflation that's happening in the world and that's causing lots of anxiety and lots of fear that we can have in, in our thinking. But it's important for us as disciples of Jesus, us as people whose minds are set on having God's priority that really see the kingdom economy instead of the world economy dominating our thinking, that one, we are mindful not to be led astray by false teaching or by people that are talking about get rich quick schemes, that we're not led astray by things that cause division and, and confusion, that we don't give our hearts over to the love of money, but instead that we take hold of life that is truly life. Our prayer is that as we move forward in this fall, we'll have many more fireside chat, many more conversations like this, so that we can help the entire church and everybody that's in our community, not just to be givers, but to experience financial freedom in every area of your life. And I pray that as a church, we can be a blessing to you. I wanna encourage you to let everyone that's out of town or wasn't able to make it to service today to encourage them to be here next Sunday as we gather for our congregational worship with our Rappahannock campus and our Prince William campus. And for everyone that comes next week, we have a special gift that we're gonna be giving to 200 families to really be an encouragement to all of us so that together we can experience the freedom and understand life that is truly life. What an honor it is that we get to give to God. Remember in your giving, in your thinking, not to allow the love of money to dominate your heart, but to be generous, to be willing to share, to definitely give to God's kingdom and to give to advance the gospel, but to learn to live a life of generosity and a life of freedom in Christ, amen? Uh, if you wanna give a contribution here, we are so grateful and uh, we are so blown away by all the miracles that God is doing and will continue to do in our congregation. You can give in person. The ushers are gonna be coming down the aisle. You can give in person. You can also text to 84321. You can give through our mobile app or you can um, uh, take out your phone and scan that QR code and be able to give. You know, we are excited about how God is moving and will move as we learn to truly have God's heart and walk as he would in the world. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. Our God and Father, we thank you so much. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you, God, for the miraculous ways that you are moving to save lives, God. As we listen to JJ's story and Trinity's story, we're blown away as, God, you help us to, to see how the Holy Spirit moves, how how your spirit moves to draw people to yourself through the cross. God, we thank you, God, that we get to be co-workers with you. We get to be a part of a co-mission with you to spread the gospel here. We thank you, God, for the ways that we get to participate in this act of worship, of being able to give our first fruits to you. And we pray, God, that we would experience the freedom that you intend for us to experience, God, the freedom in our minds, the freedom in our hearts, the freedom in the way that we manage the resources that we've been entrusted with, and that, God, we can be a source of encouragement because of a heart of generosity that we have, generosity with our time, generosity with our talents, and generosity with the treasure that you've given to us, God. Thank you, God, that we as a church get to experience life that is truly life because of your love. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. I was so encouraged that Randall called me Will because when Randall first saw me at church, he said that my shirt reminded him of Blue's Clues. So I was, 
I was preparing myself for him to say, Steve. Uh, so so I, was, I, was, I was bracing myself. Thank you, Randall. You are so kind. And uh, here you go. There you go, Steve. I know. I know. Thank you for mixing it up. I know. Young Mr. Lugo always reminds me of that when I wear this shirt. I really love this shirt. Tasha loves this shirt. But hey, if you think Blue's Clues, what can I say? It's, it's, what's that? The color of money. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Green. Cool. Fireside. It's a fireside chat shirt. There you go. That's right. Thank you so much, Charlie. So amen. So grateful we got this chance to be together. I, I got to be honest. I was so blown away by the communion and just by JJ and Trinity's heart. You know, we had the opportunity. JJ didn't share this. I would not have made it um, in Colorado if not for, for him. He had his son on a backpack as we were going up the Manitou Incline, which is like a, a, a mile high set of stairs at like 8,000 feet elevation. And um, uh, Dario and Manolo and Julio and I were do- training on those stairs as we're getting ready to do the race that we, we did. So this is my first time meeting JJ and uh, God bless him. He had a bunch of ministry questions. I only had a half a lung worth of oxygen. And we're going up the stairs. And he's like, so tell me like how you move your ministry. And I was like, ah, you. and literally, no joke. I'm not exaggerating. He can, this is not an exaggeration. I was on my hands and knees praying to God, thinking I wish I had trained more and prepared better. And of course, you guys know, Dario and Julio were like blazing up the mountain. They were like, Pew. they went right up the, the thing. And um, Manolo was kind enough to stay with me and JJ God bless you, bro. Thank you. He's a good minister of Christ Jesus. He cares for the weak and <laughs> works with the, with the poor and decrepit old people. So thank you for your kindness. It is good to see you. And uh, after him, him seeing me in perhaps one of the more embarrassing states, I was like, all right, well, I guess that was the last conversation I have with JJ. And uh, no, I didn't think that because he's just a very generous, hearty guy. Uh, we got the opportunity to see each other at the conference in Orlando. And they said, hey, we, we've been watching what you guys have been doing, and we want to just come uh, and see what's happening here in Potomac Valley. We've had such incredible conversations with them. We're so excited about the church in Colorado Springs and grateful to be able to share what God's blessed us with. Amen? So, so grateful to have y'all. Let's go to God in a word of prayer, and we're going to dig in. We're in week two of our three-week series as we look at the sermon that revolutionized the church. Our God and Father, thank you so much for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your compassion. Thank you for opening our eyes to understand the scriptures. Open our eyes now as we open the scriptures. Help us to really hear from you, hear your word, be moved by your word so we can be what you want us to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's turn on over to Acts chapter 7. So we looked last week at Acts chapter 6, and now we're continuing... Uh, We're midway through this sermon in Acts chapter 7 as our brother Stephen is standing before the Sanhedrin. And as he's standing before the Sanhedrin, he begins his remarks by reminding these religious leaders, these brothers and fathers who had devoted themselves to being the sons of Abraham, that Abraham's call was a call to go. It was a call to go, to leave Haran, to to leave his people and his country, to go wherever God would send him. And that Abraham's faith is the faith that their convictions, that their heritage was built on. Now these were people who had devoted themselves to, to following the law and listening to the instructions of Moses. And so the next place that Stephen goes to is he seeks to persuade these religious leaders to remember who God is and to follow the Messiah, the next place he goes to is to Moses himself. We're going to pick up in verse 20 of chapter 7. It says, At that time, Moses was born, and he was no ordinary child. For three months he was cared for in his father's home. When he was uh, placed outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him up as her own son. He was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. When Moses was 40 years old, he's a grown man now, he decided to visit his fellow Israelites. 
He saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian, so he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. The next day Moses came upon two Israelites who were fighting. He tried to reconcile them by saying, men, you are brothers. Why do you want to hurt each other? But the man who was mistreating the other pushed Moses aside and said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? When Moses heard this, he fled to Midian, where he settled as a foreigner and had two sons. Now, the account that God uses Moses to document in um, the, the first five books of the, the Bible of Moses' life does not take a lot of time to go into Moses' story between in the years uh, between when he is adopted by Pharaoh's daughter and when he becomes a prince of Egypt and, uh, and then ends up going off to the land uh, of Midian. But uh, a lot of Jewish writing speaks about the stories of Moses and his background. And a non-Christian um, uh, historian, Josephus, tells us about the accounts that were told about Moses' life. One of these accounts, and this is an extra biblical text, one of these accounts say that Moses was such a beautiful child that they would carry him through the streets and people would marvel at how beautiful he was. That he was just one of those kids that just grab you. You know, there's some people, they just grab you. Like every day when I look at my wife, I'm like, man. <laughs> it's like, you know, I'm just telling you, that's how it is. I did, that's how it is for me. And uh, it doesn't need to be like that for you, but it sure is like that for me. I'm just letting you know what it is. This is September, and we've been married for 23 years at the end of this month. I am so grateful. This is a good woman, and she is amazing. But there are some people that just have that striking beauty. And Moses was a, a good-looking young baby. And, uh, and, and what this, this extra-biblical account says is that uh, Pharaoh's daughter went to Pharaoh and said, Moses is such an amazing child. He should be the next Pharaoh. And Pharaoh jokingly took the crown from his head and put it on the baby. And the baby reached up and took the crown and threw it down to the ground. And, and the wise men of, of Egypt said, this child needs to be put to death right away because if he is not killed, he will lead to the fall of Egypt. And Pharaoh's daughter uh, pled with her father and said, that was just a baby. It was just an accident. He was just being bam, bam. It's not a big deal. And, and Pharaoh didn't do anything about it. So this was a, a part of this extra biblical account. Why that is significant is because it, it helps us to understand at least a, a bit of the decision that Moses would have made as a grown man to let go of everything that he had, everything that he knew, everything that he had lived for, to let go of all the prestige of the world. He was educated, it says in the biblical text, it says he was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. Other extra biblical accounts say that Moses led a campaign under Egypt's armies into Ethiopia and was a conquering warrior. He was a man of action, a man of education, a man of, of, of prestige, one that was held in high regard, and he decided to give it all up because he thought, that he would be the one to help rescue his people. But he wanted to rescue them based on his own terms. As Stephen is explaining this to these people, he's explaining that Moses had a worldly mindset, even in his desire to do what was right. And God had to re-educate Moses and help him to understand who he was. By the time God calls Moses to be that deliverer, he is a very different man. We'll pick up in verse 30. You still with me? Yeah. After 40 years, he is 80 years old. 
An angel appeared to Moses in the flames of a burning bush in the desert near Mount Sinai. And he saw this and he was amazed at the sight. And he went over to look more closely and he heard the Lord's voice. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses trembled with fear and did not dare to look. Then he said to him, take off your sandals. The place where you're standing is holy ground. I have indeed seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. And I've heard their groans and I've come down to set them free. Now come, I will send you back to Egypt. This is the same Moses who was rejected with the words, who made you ruler and judge? He was sent to be their ruler and deliverer by God himself through the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He led them out of Egypt and did wonders and miraculous signs in Egypt at the Red Sea and for 40 years in the desert. This is the Moses who told the Israelites, I will send you a prophet like me from your own people. He was in the assembly in the desert with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, and he received living words to pass on to us. Brothers and sisters, verse 39 asks an important question of all of us, as Stephen asked of them. But our fathers refused to obey him. Instead, they rejected him and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. They told Aaron, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who led us out of Egypt, we do not know what's happened to him. This, of course, when he was up in, in, with God up in the mountain. This was the time they made an idol in the form of a calf and they brought sacrifices to it and held a celebration in honor to what their hands had made. God turned away and gave them over to the worship of the heavenly bodies. This agrees what was written uh, in, the, in the book of the prophets. Now Stephen makes an important distinction right here. Because Stephen, who was Greek speaking, does not refer and does not quote from the, the Hebrew translation of, of, of this text which is a text from the book of Amos, he actually uses the Greek translation of this text. Now remember that the, the, the argument that had happened, the people that were opposing him, the people that had rallied all these folks in opposition to him were the, 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 those who were from the synagogue of freedmen, Jews from Cyrene and Alexandria. These were Greek-speaking Jews themselves who were jealous of the fact that the early church was able to have a unity and a fellowship and a camaraderie that they'd never seen before because the church submitted itself to follow the fire, to follow the Holy Spirit. And he says, did you bring me sacrifices and offerings 40 years in the desert, O house of Israel? You have lifted up the shrine of Molech and the star of your God, lower G God, Rephan the idols you've made to worship. Therefore, I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. Our forefathers had the tabernacle and the testimony with them in the desert. It's been made, uh, it was made as God directed Moses according to the pattern he had seen. Having received the tabernacle, our fathers under Joshua brought it with them when they took the land from the, uh, the nations God drove out before them, it remained in the land until the time of David, who enjoyed God's favor. And he asked that he might provide a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built the house for him. However, and now he's referring to the book of Isaiah, this, this chapter in Isaiah 66, which, which begins by saying, the Most High does not live in houses made by man, as the prophet says, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or where will my resting place be? Has not my hands made all these things? You see, the, the Jewish leaders at the time had forgotten that life was not about the temple. They, they had fixated themselves on the restoration of the temple. It had taken 40 plus years for the temple to be restored. And, and, and they thought that God lived in the temple and that God was a God just for them. And Stephen is explaining that God is a God for all people. 
God is a God that calls all people. And the question I want to start off by asking us this morning is have you turned back in your heart? See, there's a difference between your physical presence and being emotionally present. And all of us who are fathers, we understand this. Because you can physically be in the house with your kids and not be there emotionally. And all of the wives that are in this room understand this. Because you can be talking to your husband and he's not physically, he might be physically present, but he's emotionally absent. This will be a great test through football season to be both physically and emotionally present. This is a high bar, but I believe that we are equal to this task. Amen? Amen. Or at least that we will need a lot of grace to make it through. But these folks, this Sanhedrin, they had turned back to Egypt in their hearts. And Stephen is pointing out to them Something that a lot of us have a difficult time truly embracing. Before we go into how they respond, I want to share from another one of our brothers, James, in James chapter 1. Turn over to James chapter 1. Are you still with us? In James chapter 1, and uh, all of us who struggle with passion, strong passions, we know this passage really well, amen? In James chapter 1 and verse 19, my dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. For a man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, Get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word that is planted in you which can save you. Moral filth is the worst kind. It said moral filth. That's the filth that religious people have. That's church people filth. That's you look good on the outside, but in your heart, your heart's rotten. That's you know how to speak Kinglish, but you don't have a kingdom mindset. You don't have a kingdom schedule. You don't have kingdom priorities, but you sound really good. Now, I'm just going to tell you honestly, I find it very difficult to be a Christian. And that may be really alarming to you because you came to the church and the preacher's telling you, he's not, I'm just letting you know from jump. I know how to talk Christian. I know how to walk Christian. I know a lot of scriptures about being a Christian. But actually, being a Christian is hard. Because this scripture says that I need to be slow to become angry. My first default emotion is anger. It has been my strongest and most dominant emotion. Thank you, Siri. Um, yeah, I know, Siri. Thank you. You always let me know. I won't get angry with Siri. It's just who I am. That's my first emotion. Tasha's been helping me with my heart, my brothers that are in my life. I'm grateful that I got the elders. I got Patrick and Tom to help me with my heart. Like, I don't find it easy to be a Christian. And because being a Christian means I got to deal with not just the things that seem right, but the things that are right. There's a, a quote that I learned as a child. It was the motto for the school I grew up in. It's es quam vidarde. It means to be rather than to appear. I'll be honest with you. I'm about done with people appearing to be Christians and proving to be false. I, I, don't, I don't, maybe you're not done. Maybe you, can, you can take some more hypocrisy. I'm, I'm done with all the stories of people that compromise and, 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 and don't live out what they actually believe. Now, at the same time, we're human, so we fall short. So that's why I think it's important that we are slow to speak and that we're quick to listen and that we're slow to become angry and that we deal with the moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent. The, James goes on to explain this, however. 
He says, don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. So you can come to church and lie to yourself. You can come to church and say, I made it to church. I'm good Christian. Nobody's saying amen to that. <laughs> you could. There are lots of people that go to church and they lie to themselves. And I don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. That's not what we're trying to be here. The scripture says, do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word and does not do what it says is like a person who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do it, not forgetting what he has, what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. If anyone considers himself religious, if anyone considers herself religious, anybody that wants to be religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Why is this so critical to what we're reading? It is because Stephen is the epitome of pure religion. Stephen is the example of pure religion. Stephen took care of the widows. Stephen loved the people that were hurting. Stephen was committed to living out the faith that we seek to practice. And Stephen was telling the religious leaders the truth. And they were consumed by moral filth. C.S. Lewis says, of all bad men, religious bad men are the worst. Our goal as a church is not to increase the number of members in our congregation, but to increase the number of disciples that are a part of our community. Amen. We do not simply want to fill seats. We want transformed lives because people who committed themselves to walking like Jesus, as Stephen did, will change the world. And make no mistake about it, if, if there was ever any question, there are no political solutions. As in none. As in like there's not a Republican solution or a Democratic solution. I love everyone. Y'all know I love all the politicians because my dad was a politician. So I just see my family. I don't want nobody to mess their life up. We love people from every background, but I don't look to them for answers. There are no economic leaders that are going to come and save us. And there are no religious leaders. Please don't look to me for the answer. Because I am not the one to help you. But we together can follow Jesus. I made a commitment to be the first follower. I will show up and follow Jesus. And if I fall down, please pick me back up. And if I fall short, please let me know. And if you fall short, I'll try to tell you gently. And if I don't say it gently, please forgive me. And we can work it out together. Amen? Yes. But Stephen wasn't pulling punches. He was telling them, look, this is what Abraham did. This is what Moses did. Now, I don't know about you, but I grew up with an idealized view of history. And I always thought to myself, if it was back in slavery times, I know what I'd do. Or if it was back in, in the civil rights movement, there I would be. Or if it was back in, you know, the time of some great conquest, this is what I would do. And I think that's important to this context because what Stephen is telling these people is, you are just like your father. Now, I don't know if you, that's like a really offensive thing to say. But not the good family members. He wasn't like the one that you're proud of. He was like, you're like the same people that rejected Moses. If you were back in the time of Moses, you guys would have been the complainers. If you were back in the time of Abraham, you'd be the one that was questioning why he left Haran. Which is not a flattering thing to say to someone. This is not how you make friends and influence people. Just so you know. And in case you think I'm, I'm, there's hyperbole, let's read verse 51. You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, both your heart and your ear needs to be cut. You are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. 
was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? Was there ever one? Was there ever one you didn't persecute? You even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you betrayed and murdered him. And you have you who received the law that was put into effect by angels and have not obeyed it. How long will they kill our prophets while we stand aside and look? How many more stories do you need before you're going to repent? He did not pull any punches. He didn't. And why is this significant? Because there were only two choices for Stephen. They were going to repent or they were going to rebel. And what did they do? They chose the worst possible option. They chose to let their anger, their jealousy, their moral filth, the undealt with areas in their life consume them. And they did the unthinkable. There was no Jewish law. There was no right that the Sanhedrin had to do this. This was mob justice. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen something like this before. I don't know if you've ever seen mob justice at work. I don't know if you've ever seen a stone fight before. But where I grew up in high school, I've seen mob justice. I remember there was a guy that stole a boom box from my boarding house back when boom boxes were a thing. You remember boom boxes? He stole a boom box and he jumped out a window and the students that were in the boarding house with me, they caught him and they beat him within an inch of his life. And then the police showed up and they stood there and watched as they beat him some more. And one of my boarding room, boarding house classmates took a cinder block and dropped it on this guy's head. And I'll never forget seeing that. And I, you know, I was 12 years old and I was like, that's what happens when mob justice rules. Now I wasn't standing there giving approval of what's happening, but I, I, uh, I was just frozen. And every time I read Stephen's account, I think about the choice that that thief made and the choice that happens when people choose to let violence be their solution. We've got a lot of young men in our world who have not been offered a direction or a solution other than violence being their solution. And as a church, we've got to recognize that we cannot stand silent in a world that is giving itself over to violence and act as if we do not have the answer. But we cannot match violence for violence and think that that solves any problems either. What we see that happens next changes the church. When they heard this, they were furious and gnashed at their teeth. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing. Jesus is said to be sitting at the right hand of God, sitting with him in shared judgment, preparing to, to bring final judgment on the world. But Stephen, in that moment, looked up, and Jesus, instead of sitting, Jesus stood up. Jesus is standing up. That posture would indicate that Jesus was commending Stephen. Jesus was recognizing the moment. Jesus was recognizing his disciple going through what he'd gone through with the same group of people that he'd gone through it with. Jesus standing as his advocate at the right hand of God. And he looked up and he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelled at the top of their voices. And they all rushed at him and dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And just so you know, the stoning that they would have done would not be the stoning like many of us would have in our minds that they would just pick up stones and start pelting him with little rocks. This stoning would be that they would take him to the edge of a, a cliff or a high, a high area and they would throw him off. And if he died in the fall, he died. But if he did not die in the fall, they would take large boulders and roll those boulders on top of him and literally bury him alive. This was the way that a stoning would be done in that time. 
according to many commentaries that address how people would, would enact this kind of mob violence. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And this is the turning point. Stephen doesn't do what Moses did at 40. Stephen doesn't do what so many people have done in our history. While they were stoning him. While they were stoning him. Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he said this, he fell asleep. Forgiveness starts the next chapter. Jesus prays as he's on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And Stephen prays as he's being killed, Lord, do not hold the sin against them. How do we fight our battles? It is going to be fun with football season. It is very exciting. All the things that are happening in so many arenas. It is Labor Day weekend, but we do live here in Northern Virginia, and there's a probability that there will be a very vitriotic political season in 2022, and a vitriotic political season in 2023, and a vitriotic political season in 2024, and people will try to compete for all of your emotions, and you're gonna to have to decide to be a Christian no matter what comes out the gate. And we, as a church, are committed to the fact that all people that have all sorts of views are part of our community. So we have to decide how we're gonna fight our battle. Now what a number of folks are doing is they will coalesce people who believe what they believe and use that as a battering ram against other people. We will not do that. What some folks would do is they won't deal with the real issues and they'll just sing you nice songs and then when you go out the door, you can take that up from there. We will not do that. Instead, what we will do is we will be Christians. We will choose the path of forgiveness even though it's the hardest path. And you have to recognize that the turning point that happens is Stephen is being murdered and Saul, who would become the greatest evangelist of all time, was the violent man that was a part of the mob giving approval to what was happening. Some of the people that you think are the worst of the worst of the worst will be called to be and do the greatest things you've ever seen. Are we prepared to love them? Are we prepared to forgive them? I got to tell you, that's hard for me. I'm, nobody's saying amen to that. It's hard. But that's why you don't follow me and I don't follow you. We follow Jesus. Turn on over to Luke chapter 6. You still with me? We said we're going to follow the fire, so you got to expect to get burnt. You, at least feel warm. Okay. You, can, you can't be cold and follow the fire. Right. Be like, yeah, yeah, it's going to be just entertaining. You didn't come here for entertainment. You can do that afterwards. You came here for conviction, amen? amen. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6 and verse 27. I know we've, led a, we've read a lot of Scripture today, but we need a lot of Scripture for what's coming. But I tell you who hear me, this is red letter, this is Jesus. I tell you who hear me, love your enemies. Love your enemies. There are lots of religions that tell you, love those who love you. There are lots of parties that will tell you, love our people and hate those people. But we reject that narrative because we follow Jesus as Stephen did, amen? We will love our enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. If he wants to take your cloak, don't stop him from taking your tunic. Give to everyone who asks. If anyone takes 
What belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you'd have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you accept, expect repayment, what credit is that? Even sinners lend to sinners and expect repayment in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High who is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful as your Father is merciful. The beginning of 2020 was the absolute worst beginning of a year in my entire life. The end of the first month, my mother died. And my heart was like wrecked. And a few days later, family members from Jamaica sent me a message showing me that um, someone who we knew closely, who we thought was a friend to the family, had defrauded our family out of my family's inheritance and had dishonored my father's hard work that he'd spent his whole life uh, doing. The, the pain of losing my mother and the reminder and the reopening of my father's wound and the injustice against our family that happened, that had the consequence of hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars worth of money stolen from my family, took me to one of the darkest places I've ever been in my life. And Phil and Shinda know because we talked about it, and the elders know because we talked about it. I'm telling you, having dealt with it, I will be completely honest with you. I had, I genuinely thought in February, March, April of 2020, I don't know that I can be a minister because I am denying myself from getting on a plane and going to Jamaica and suspending everything that I've ever done as a Christian and literally taking someone's life because of what they did to our family. I understand anger and loss and rage and injustice at a visceral level. And I'm so grateful. I remember I was talking to Shinda and Shinda said, Will, you got complicated grief. You need counseling. No way you didn't talk to everybody you can talk to. Go find a counselor that does grief counseling. And I went and got grief counseling. I appreciate that. And I, I planned on a one hour session. About two and a half hours in, I was still talking. And then church closed because of the pandemic. And the one place that I would go for solitude was running. And then Ahmad Avery was, was murdered in Georgia on a Sunday afternoon. And I felt like I can't even go out and run anymore and find peace. And then George Floyd, who's the same age as, would be the same age as me, was murdered in the summer. And we were wrestling with so many difficult issues as a church, and I felt like my heart was being ripped apart. 2020 was brutal. 2021 was challenging. I'm so glad we're in 2022. And I don't know what comes next, but I tell you what I decided in those days, in those dark moments, I decided that I'm going to follow Jesus no matter what. You, this scripture doesn't mean anything until you've had an enemy. This scripture doesn't mean anything until someone struck you on the cheek and taken your stuff. And you've got to decide whether you actually believe what we read. See, C.S. Lewis says, to be Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. This is what made Paul who he is. And this is the turning point that we're going to explore next week as we are going to be introduced to a church that is on the move. A church that will be powered by the faith and the movement of the Holy Spirit. A church that is decentralized, that will move beyond Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. A church that understood that forgiveness, forgiveness is the answer. The next chapter for us as we move forward is not the chapter of coalescing our own ideas or hardening our boundaries around, around ourselves or building walls between us and the world, 
But instead, it is the courage to go where God sends us, to go to a place we've never been before, the courage to deal with the deep issues in our hearts so that we might be real Christians. I know there are a lot of churches you can go to where people just talk about stuff. I know there are a lot of people that tell you stuff they believe. I'm telling you about a faith I know and a God I know. And he's taken me from the pit and saved my soul. And he's taken so many of us from the pit and from darkness. We are not good people. We are not the best people. We are the worst of the worst that have been saved by the greatest. And we are grateful that you would join us for worship. We're grateful to share the gospel with you. We need good news right now. And we need to be good news to the world. As you go out these doors, remember, the next chapter begins with forgiveness. Forgiveness ain't easy, but forgiveness is what we bring. Let me pray for us. Our God and Father, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for my brother Stephen. I pray, God, that all of us will be able to stand in the line with him and look him squarely in the eye. His courage shows us that imperfect people can devote themselves to pure religion. Imperfect people can speak plain truth. Imperfect people can remind us how we need to be transformed by your Holy Spirit. And imperfect people can truly be disciples. God, help us to have his heart to speak truth and not sugarcoat the realities of the world. To have his heart, his example, God, to follow our brother's example of forgiveness. When we are mistreated, when there are pains or hurts that we have within us, God, help us not to cover that over and plaster over it and put a suit over it and spray, spray so we look and smell good, but help us to crack our hearts open so your Holy Spirit can bring in the salve, can bring in the healing, can bring in the wholeness. God, help us to learn the power of forgiveness and the power of the transformation of the Holy Spirit and help us to have great wisdom and faith for we are the church on the move, a church that will take the gospel beyond this place to wherever you send us, to wherever you take us this week. Guide and direct us and help us to come back together here again so we might dig deeper into your word to be changed by your scriptures. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.